Hi, my name is Matt Schulke, and I'm currently training to become a physician scientist at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. A little bit of background about myself. I grew up in the Chicago suburbs and always wanted to be a doctor. Though I was studying bioengineering at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, while there, I learned what it meant to be a physician scientist. I worked in one of their labs. And what that means is to become both trained to become a doctor and to be a scientist. And that makes each side better. Being a scientist makes you a better doctor, and being a doctor makes you a better scientist. And so I came to Mayo Clinic to pursue that training. I'm currently in my seventh year out of eight for the program, so I'll be graduating next year, meaning I've finished my PhD and I'm back in the medical school seeing patients. In the future, I plan to become a pediatrician, and specifically a pediatrician who treats kids with cancer. So today, I'm gonna to talk to you about cancer and what causes cancer and how we can treat it. So the specific questions I'm gonna ask are why doesn't everyone get cancer? And can we use that knowledge to develop novel cancer treatments? And I'll explain more as we go along. So first question is what is cancer? At its bare bones level, cancer is the uncontrolled proliferation of cells. That means that cells keep growing and growing and growing and growing and never stop until ultimately the patient dies. So as an example of what that looks like, I'll show you here. You can see on the left, you have these normal cells. And this, for example, might just be skin. So skin, you have organized layers, small cells, everything where it should be, and nothing goes past the bottom into other tissues. However, cancer cells, they change. Their normal cells gone awry. So you can see they're bigger, they're less organized, they're pushing, they're growing. And if this picture was to continue, if this would be a movie that we played forward, we might see these blue cells break through the bottom and spread and grow into other tissue where they shouldn't be. So certain things characterize cancer. This is actually from a very famous paper many years ago. We've learned a lot more since then, but these same truths still hold. Cancer cells and tumors they avoid cell death, as you can see in the gray. They keep growing, as you see in the green. They get rid of their off switches. So they evade growth suppressors that try to slow them down, natural things to stop cancer. As I mentioned, they might invade, they might break through into other tissues and grow in other places and spread to the brain or the lungs or the abdomen. They grow forever. You can see here that normal cells kind of reach an end of their life, that's natural, and then they die, and everything goes on. Human is fine. That might be part of the reason why we age. However, cancer cells are unable to age. They've turned off those pathways to keep dividing over and over and over again. And then lastly, in the red, they get their own blood vessels. It's called angiogenesis. They create their own blood supply, so that way they can get all the oxygen nutrients they need to keep growing. Growing, growing, growing. That's what cancer does. Grows, grows, grows. So what causes cancer? Here's a diagram that I found that shows a lot of the different things that can cause cancer. Heredity, your genes. Does, you have, does cancer run in your family? UV radiation, this is where sunlight or working at a nuclear power plant or things of that nature that cause your body to get cancer. This is where skin cancer comes from. Chemicals, certain chemicals, carcinogens, things that have that label on them might be uh, inducing cancer. Certain viruses, this is why all of you are recommended to get the HPV vaccine. The HPV vaccine prevents cervical cancer because HPV causes cervical cancer. There are also other viruses, uh, hepatitis virus, HBV, HCV. A lot of the vaccines that we have nowadays, several of them at least, are specifically to prevent the spread of cancer through these viruses. Smoking causes cancer, you're likely aware of that. But ultimately anything, anytime a cell divides and grows, there's a potential for cancer. So that's why even if you have perfect family, never grow out in the sun, never have chemicals, never have viruses, never smoke, you can still get cancer. So what unifies all of these causes is that they have DNA damage. And so you're probably familiar with DNA. DNA is the, uh, the molecules that make up our cells that tell my hair to be blonde and tell my gut to be gut and my skin to be skin and, and that organize the, uh, the proteins and activities of the cell. 
So if you mess with those things, if you break those things, then ultimately your cell is going to continue dividing and growing and becoming cancer. So if there are all these ways to get cancer, even just growing up gives you cancer, why don't we all get it? There are many complex answers to this question. I'm going to simplify it for you today. But two different main aspects, one on this slide and one on the next slide. So on the left here, you can imagine this normal cycle of a healthy cell that gets some DNA damage. Maybe you were out in the sun too long. Maybe you, uh, maybe you had secondhand smoke from someone around you. But ultimately, your cell becomes damaged with DNA. Fortunately, we all have pathways in our cells, very complex pathways. People do their whole lives studying these pathways that repair that DNA. Ultimately, that goes back to a normal, healthy cell. All is well, life goes on, no cancer. You have enough damage, or if the DNA repair pathway isn't perfect, there are always leaks and uh, nothing is, is foolproof, you get unrepaired DNA damage and a cell that has a lot of it. So what happens to the cell? There are three options. The first of which, it becomes senescent. That just kind of means old, non-proliferating. This is kind of what we think might cause some of the aging that happens. In that those cells, after they lived a long time, had a lot of damage, they just leave and say, you know what, I'm going to stay on my own. I'm not going to cause any cancer. I'm also not going to die, but I'll just sit there. That's one option. The next option is to become apoptotic. That means the cell commits suicide rather than cause a cancer. And because we have so many cells in our bodies, that's okay. In fact, that's a really good option. That's actually the most productive option because that happens in a way that doesn't cause trouble. It just kind of involutes, gets smaller, dies as well. However, that doesn't happen with every cell. Some become a cancer cell. And that's where the immune system comes in. Now, I did my PhD in immunology, so I have a particular interest. I could bore you for hours, but I'm just going to give you a quick overview of what the immune system is. You've likely heard about this before, particularly in this uh, COVID-19 crisis. So the immune system is made up of many different things not only cells and antibodies and things, but also physiologic barriers, having intact skin, having good lungs that clear uh, the secretions we have, having acid in our stomach. So there are definitely some mechanical things like that, but also there are these other pathways. There's the innate immunity and adaptive immunity. Innate immunity senses patterns. It says that overall, a bunch of us are going to get strep throat. And we've been getting strep throat for a very long time. And so the body, from the outset, says we're going to be prepared to defend against strep throat. And so there are certain patterns that are recognized, either patterns that cells recognize or patterns in the proteins that we make. However, in a situation like we're in right now with COVID-19 and the SARS-CoV-2 virus, we have never seen that before. That's brand new. And so our body also has what's called an adaptive immunity arm with cells and proteins called antibodies that can learn and detect new things and figure out how to fight those new things. So we have patterns, we have new things, but overall the biggest thing the immune system does is recognize and distinguish between self and non-self. If it's self, that means it's the normal me. I don't need to fight it. Just let it go, keep growing, keep doing its thing. But if it's non-self, that either means, one, I'm getting invaded, which is bad, virus, bacteria, fungus, fight it off, parasite. Or that means I have cancer. That those normal skin cells you saw before have turned blue and angry and are starting to become cancer. And that's when the immune system comes in. So how does the immune system eliminate cancer? So you can see here that, once again, we have our blue kind of abnormal cells doing their thing here. But we also have these immune cells. These are CD4 and CD8 T cells. They're really experts at cancer killing or NK or NKT cells that are also experts in cancer killing. And what they do is they recognize, they're able to see these cells are blue, they aren't gray, so I need to kill them. They have many different ways to do that. They punch holes in cells, they secrete molecules that kill cells, they find pathways in the cells that are still available and allow them to commit apoptosis. And that's really ultimately why we don't all have cancer. That's one of the main ways that it works, is that immunosurveillance, the immune system, surveilling or watching our body and nipping cancer in the bud. This isn't even really cancer at this point that we would know about because ultimately the body just kills it and moves on. All life is good. But as we do know, cancer ultimately does develop 
sometimes. And so why does that happen? As we get older, our immune system doesn't do quite as well. It's one reason why the greatest risk factor for cancer is age. And that the balance is kind of struck. The immune system says, I'll kill a few of you. The cancer says, okay, that's fine, but I'll stay here. And so you reach this balance, but ultimately the tumor does escape. As you can see, the blue cells become green cells and the green cells in this example can't be seen by the purple immune cells. And so now you have a cancer that can evade and escape and become the cancer that you know, causes, causes disease and ultimately causes death in patients. So we've talked about what can keep cancer away from us. And that's the immune system is one of the main things. And so perhaps, what if we use the immune system? Because in the case of the far right panel, the immune system has failed at its job. But could we reinvigorate it in a way that brings us back to the left? That's where the concept of immunotherapies comes in. So what are immunotherapies? Immunotherapies are actually have a storied history. Back, the first one that was really recognized was back in the 1800s. This man named William Coley, he was a surgeon, an American surgeon. And he recognized that there were um, some cases that when some people had cancer, they would get an infection and the cancer would go away. And this was somewhat well known. And so he thought, he took it on himself. And he said, you know what? I am, he was treating with bacteria. And so he took his cancer patients who had disease and those patients, he decided to say, what if I injected their tumor with a skin infection? and gave them an infection. And so he did this. You can see a patient on the left that had this, this sarcoma of the jaw, and he injected them many times, dozens of times. And ultimately, you can see in the far right, he did pretty well. This didn't happen with everybody. Some patients did die because the infection took over their body. But this is the first proof of principle that this could be done. So one way that we do this in the modern medicine age, and that we're starting to do more and more, is to use something called oncolytic virus. Onc means cancer. Lytic means breaking, and a virus is a virus. So these are cancer-breaking viruses. So when those cancer cells decide to proliferate and grow forever, that means they're not able to kill themselves like a normal cell. And that's one cell's defense, as I mentioned before, against a virus or against cancer is to say, you know what? It's better that I die and the body lives, and so I'm gonna kill myself. Or they're able to fight off the cancer. And so on the top, you can see a healthy cell, excuse me, fight off the virus. On the top, you can see a healthy cell that by the virus, just fine. And these are viruses that are naturally in the environment or some that we've engineered specifically for cancer. But in a cancer cell, you can see that virus expands and grows and ultimately breaks the cell. And that not only kills the tumor, but it alerts the immune system. Because remember, the immune system is meant to recognize infections and cancers. In this case, it's missed the cancer, but now there's an infection. And so maybe and it's been successful in many patients, killing the tumor with the virus um, wakens up and, and alerts the immune system to the cancer that's within it and causes the immune system not only to fight the virus, but to fight the cancer too, increasing survival. Another way that we do this is what's something called immune checkpoint blockade. When cancer cells develop, one thing they do is they learn how to turn off the T cells. There are signals that block it, put brakes on the immune system. So what have we done? We've learned what those breaks are and how they function, and we block them. We create molecules that block that interaction, allow a T cell to be turned on to do its job and to kill that tumor. These have been very successful for things like melanoma or small cell lung cancer. Many diseases are being studied right now, many cancers, using immune checkpoint blockade to take the breaks off the immune system. And the last example I'm gonna share with you are CAR T cells. Now, in a, in a patient, for example, on the far left here, those patients' immune cells, their T cells, have not been successful at treating the cancer. That's why you have a cancer. They have failed, unfortunately. But what we can do is we can take those T cells out of the body in the left, and we can engineer them with a chimeric antigen receptor gene. Look it up if you'd like, it's a CAR gene. This is a synthetic, a, a manufactured, an engineered receptor that recognizes the cancer. So even if the cells couldn't originally detect the cancer, we can engineer them so now they can. We grow those cells, you can see that kind of blue spike here. Put that blue spike on the cells, we put them back into the patient, and now these cells can recognize the cancer, and they can treat it. This has been incredibly successful with a disease called acute lymphoblastic leukemia, which is one of the most common pediatric cancers. 
previously, we've been pretty good at treating it with about 90% of patients having a good response to our traditional chemotherapy, the chemotherapy that makes your hair fall out, gives you diarrhea and things like that. But of the 10%, they did pretty badly. This causes a response in 90% of those patients. Now we need to continue to learn how long that lasts and some of the side effects, because rather than having your hair fall out, this can give you a really bad flu, the kind of a flu that gets you into the intensive care unit sometimes and can ultimately sometimes kill patients. And so we're learning about what CAR T cells can do, what immunotherapies can do. But overall, immunotherapy has been a huge breakthrough in cancer treatment. This is a breakthrough of the year in 2013, and we've seen many drugs being approved for their use. And so as you guys become the future physicians and scientists and, and uh, professionals in America who are using these drugs, I expect that you'll continue to see them being used and, and growing in their importance. And that's something that I hope to do. I hope to bring a lot of the promise of these drugs into kids. A lot of the research has been done in adults, and we're just starting to work with kids. So I hope to be a big part of that in the future. And so with that, I end my presentation. Um, this has been a mini lesson by a medical scientist. And if you have any questions, feel free to uh, ask your teacher and she can, uh, he can, whoever it is, can reach out to me. And uh, I look forward to hearing from all of you. Thank you very much.